Good morning. It's great to be with you all. Last time I was here, I think, was about five years ago in 2017. And I uh, taught on the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, it's great to be back and to see some of the faces that I remember from last time. And again, we're going to be talking about the Trinity today. <laughs> in, in a way, we're going to be focusing on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is definitely related to that. Uh, please turn in the back of your Trinity Psalter hymnals to page 880. And we'll be looking at Lord's Day 20 of the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 53. Please uh, respond in unison to the answer. So I'll, I'll ask the question and you respond together. You read both of them, but we'll join you in the answer. Oh, okay. All right, I'll read both of them and then you'll join me in the answer. Uh, question 53, what do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? First, that the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son is eternal God. Second, that he is given also to me so that through true faith, he makes me share in Christ and all his benefits, comforts me, and will remain with me forever. And then for our scripture reading, we'll be looking at a number of passages in the Gospel of John. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 20. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's word. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And then turning over to John chapter 15, verse 26. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. I'm sorry, I have the wrong chapter. I was in chapter 16. Uh, chapter 15, verse 25, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And then in John 16, I will read verses 7 and 12 through 15. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then verses 12 to 15, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us as we hear his word. Thank you, Lord, for this portion of your word and for the exposition of it in the Heidelberg Catechism. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would open our minds and our hearts to be receptive to what you have to say to us from this portion of your word. Show us the ministry of the Spirit. We ask that you would work in our hearts uh, by your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you remember this, but in the 1990s, there was a movement known as the Toronto Blessing. It was uh, this huge movement. It was all the rage. People were coming from all over the world to be a part of it. Large crowds of people would uh, gather together to be, quote unquote, slain in the spirit. Uh, people were found rolling on the floor, even barking in the spirit, if you can believe it, uh, laughing uncontrollably. Uh, ridiculous, right? Uh, but not much was said about Christ. There was a lot of talk about the Spirit, but not much talk about Christ. Uh, in the year 2008, 
uh, another movement arose. There was a false prophet named Todd Bentley. And he was doing the same thing, claiming to have this special ministry of the spirit. Uh, he was a big guy with tattoos, and uh, he would kick and hit and knock people over, quote unquote, in the power of the spirit. There's even this one horrifying clip where he is recounting this one incident where he said that the Holy Spirit told him to kick an elderly woman in the face with his biker boot. Ridiculous, right? This is insane. Of course, it's no surprise that we found out later that he was having an affair and he was uh, forced to step down from ministry in disgrace. All of this is claimed to be the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's a revival. It's a powerful wor work and movement of the Spirit, they say. And, of course, we have doubts about that. We're skeptical that this really is the Spirit. Uh, so we need to evaluate these things. How do we look at these claims? How do we evaluate them in light of Scripture? Well, thankfully, our Reformed forefathers have given us tremendous biblical insight into this question of how to understand the ministry of the Spirit. And so we're going to be looking at the Heidelberg Catechism's exposition of the third article of the Apostles' Creed, I Believe in the Holy Spirit, the Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. Of course, there's a lot to say about that. As I mentioned five years ago, we talked about the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, and so I'm not going to be focusing so much on the deity of the Holy Spirit, but really just this question of what is the Spirit's ministry and work? And I believe that the Heidelberg Catechism's explanation of the Spirit's ministry and work is directly from Scripture. It's from these passages that we talked about, that we read in the Upper Room Discourse. This is when Jesus uh, is on the night of his betrayal. It's Thursday night of Holy Week, and he's about to be betrayed by Judas later that night. The next day, he'll be handed over to Pontius Pilate, and he will be crucified. But before that happens, Jesus gathers his disciples together his friends, he calls them his friends, and he says, I want to share you, share with you my deepest thoughts, the thoughts of my heart. He wants his disciples to know that his relationship with them is about to undergo a change. He's going to die. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to die. And he says, sorrow will fill your hearts because I've been taken away from you. Uh, but that's temporary. He says, don't worry, I am going to come again to you in a new and more blessed way. And he's not talking about the second coming at the end of history. He's talking about coming again to them in the form of and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 7. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So he's talking about the ministry of the Spirit that he will send once he is raised from the dead, he ascends into heaven, he is going to give the, the Spirit to the church, and the Spirit, whom he calls here the helper or the comforter, will come to them. Uh, this word helper, it's hard to translate. So some Bibles will translate it as comforter, uh, some will translate it as advocate, uh, helper is also good. It's the Greek word paraclete. And it has this idea of someone who comes alongside someone else to help them, to comfort them, to encourage them, even to perhaps advocate on their behalf. That is what the Spirit's ministry is. The Spirit is the comforter, the helper, the advocate who comes along beside us, who comes alongside Christ's people to encourage us, to comfort us in our earthly pilgrimage until we join the Savior in glory at the last day. The Heidelberg Catechism, question 53, says, what do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? First, that the Spirit with the Father and the Son is eternal God. So that's the doctrine of the Trinity. We're not going to really talk about that much today, about the deity of the Spirit. But secondly, the work of the Spirit. Second, that he is given also to me so that through true faith, he makes me share in Christ and all his benefits, comforts me, and will remain with me forever. So I want to focus on those three statements about the Spirit's ministry and work. The Spirit is given so that, and then these three things, so that we may have a share in Christ and all his benefits. The, the Spirit is given to comfort us, and the Spirit will remain with us 
forever. So let's look at those three propositions, and then we'll look at the Gospel of John to see how those three propositions are backed up by Scripture. So first, the Spirit makes us to share in Christ and all his benefits. We see that in John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine, this is Jesus speaking, so he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Notice how Jesus says that statement two times. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so this teaches us a very important principle, that the Spirit's primary role is not all that stuff we were talking about, creating this feeling of excitement, this idea of revival with this outward form of people getting excited and having all kinds of experiences. That's not the the Spirit's primary role. The Spirit's primary role is this absolutely essential and yet somewhat quiet, not gloriously obvious with fireworks, right? But this quiet, essential work of taking what is Christ's and applying it to us. Taking all the benefits of Christ and applying them to us in salvation. Cornelis Venema wrote a commentary on the Apostles' Creed, and when he came to this section, I believe in the Holy Spirit, which is also what the Heidelberg Catechism is expounding, he said this, he said, the fundamental work of the Spirit is to minister to us all that we have in Christ. I love that statement. I think that is so perfect. The fundamental work of the Spirit is to minister to us all that we have in Christ. And you see that from our text. He will take what is mine. He'll take all that I am, all of my benefits, all of my glory, all of my power, all of my salvation. Just think of Christ as being this, this, uh, this sphere, this, this glory cloud with all the benefits of salvation, this, this wonderful kingdom of God that is all wrapped up in Christ. Right? All that is Christ and all that he brings. The Spirit's job is to take that to take all that is Christ, all that Christ has won for us, all that Christ has purchased for us through his death and resurrection, and to apply it to us. Or to use the way the Heidelberg Catechism explains it, through true faith, the Spirit makes me to share in Christ and all his benefits. Now it's important to remember that what Christ did in his earthly ministry, through his birth, his perfect life of obedience to God, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection, all that Christ did in history, that's called redemption accomplished. But what the Spirit does is take redemption accomplished and then apply it to us individually. Christ paid for our sins on the cross, right? He, he perfectly kept God's law for us through his perfect life of obedience to God. But the Spirit takes that, takes the righteousness of Christ, takes the atonement that Christ accomplished for us, and then applies it to us. And we, we get that application of it to our hearts when we experience it, when we have this, this experience, this knowledge of having our sins forgiven and of being justified. What are all the benefits that Christ has accomplished that the Spirit applies to us? Well, just think through the, the key events of the order of salvation, the new birth, justification, adoption, sanctification. So the new birth, this, this uh, new life that Christ purchased for us through his death and resurrection, the Spirit takes that, takes the, 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 the resurrection life of Christ and applies it to us so that we too are spiritually raised, raised from spiritual death and made alive in Christ. It's the Spirit who effectually calls us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. What Christ did you know, 2,000 years ago, is now applied to me. And so I experience it. Just as Christ was raised from the dead, so also in my experience, in my life history, when I was dead in trespasses and sins, I was made alive. I was raised up 
through the work of the Spirit, applying the work of Christ to me. After the new birth, we have justification. Of course, Christ is the one who died in order to discharge our debt. He's the one who obeyed God's law in our place, but it's the Spirit who convicts us of our sin and shows us our need of Christ and opens our eyes to see Jesus as our only righteousness. It's the Spirit who works faith within our hearts so that we might then rest upon Christ and receive forgiveness and imputed righteousness. And as a result, then we are justified in that subjective sense of experiencing the freedom of the forgiveness of sins, experiencing the cleansing of our consciences so that we are now able to view God not as our vengeful enemy who, whose wrath is against us, but as our loving Father who accepts us and welcomes us, not because of anything in us, but because of what Christ has done. When God saves us, he not only gives us new, new life, spiritual life, he not only justifies us and forgives our sins, he also adopts us. And once again, objectively, Christ is the one in whom we are adopted as God's sons and daughters. But subjectively, it's the Spirit in us by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. It's the Spirit who bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In a sense, we could say we were adopted when Christ was raised from the dead and he was publicly declared to be the Son of God with power. But that was 2,000 years ago. But the Spirit then takes what is Christ and then applies it to us so that we have that spirit of adoption within us. And our own spirit bears witness uh, with that reality. And we are able then to call God Abba, Father, and to experience that adoption. It's the Spirit's ministry then to apply the work of Christ to us. After we're adopted as God's children, we're also progressively sanctified, made more and more holy, being transformed into the image of Christ. Christ is the one who sanctified us once for all by his atoning death, but it's the Spirit who lives inside of us and renews us and changes us and transforms us into the image of Christ. And one day, even our bodies will be transformed, and he'll give us resurrection bodies to live forever with the Lord in the new creation. The fundamental work of the Spirit is to minister to us all that we have in Christ and to make us share in Christ and all his benefits. All that stuff that all these guys were talking about, hey, come to this wonderful revival, come to the Toronto Blessing, you can roll around on the floor, you can bark in the Spirit, that's nothing compared to this, right? That's like sawdust. That's just ridiculous. But what we have in Christ, these spiritual blessings that the Spirit gives to us, applying the work of Christ to us, how precious that is, how real that is, how important that is. And it doesn't come with all the outward flash. It doesn't come with all this wonderful excitement. It's something quiet and hidden, and yet it is so much more real, so much more lasting. The Spirit takes Christ and all his benefits and brings them home to our hearts for our spiritual encouragement and growth in grace. So that's the first main thing. That's the primary ministry of the Spirit, to minister to us all that we have in Christ. But that leads us then to the second work of the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit comforts us, according to the Heidelberg Catechism. And, of course, the Heidelberg is getting that from this language that the Spirit is called the Comforter, the one who comforts us. But what I want to draw out is something a little bit more precise than that. The, the Catechism doesn't mention this, but it is mentioned in John 15, 26. How does the Spirit do that? How does the Spirit comfort us? Well, the Spirit comforts us by bearing witness to Christ. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The second thing the Spirit does is to comfort us by bearing witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is how you can tell the Spirit of Christ from all the false spirits in this world. Whether it's these false teachers with their, their claimed movements of the Spirit, or maybe it's uh, false teachers on TV who are uh, preaching health and prosperity in the name of Christ, or cults who are 
denying the deity of Christ, like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, you can always tell the true spirit of Christ by this one mark, that the spirit bears, witnesses, bears witness about Christ. Uh, in John 16, verse 14, he says something similar. Uh, another way of putting it, he says, he, that is the comforter, will glorify me. Any spirit, any so-called claimed spirit that does not glorify Christ is not the spirit of God. This is how you can tell the true from the false. The spirit was sent by the risen Christ to bear witness to Christ, to glorify Christ, to lift Christ up. The spirit was not sent in order to lift up a man and his ministry. The spirit was not sent to promote disorder and chaos. The spirit was sent in order to glorify Christ. There's this one... Uh, quote that I love from J.I. Packer. <clears throat> Packer wrote a book called Walking in the Spirit or Keeping in Step with the Spirit, all about the Spirit's ministry. And in that book, he has this one section where he uses this great analogy that I love. It's the floodlight analogy. So imagine uh, if you go to a university campus, maybe Fresno State over here at night, and uh, you look at some of the wonderful buildings there, they have floodlights that are in the hedges, right, that are shining a light on the building. And you don't really care that much about the floodlights. You're not going to be, like, you know, going into the shrubs to look at the lights. You just stand back and look at the building, right? That's the spirit's role. Packer puts it this way. When floodlighting is done well, the floodlights are so placed that you do not see them. You're not, in fact, supposed to see where the light is coming from. What you're meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained. The intended effect is to make it visible when otherwise it would not be seen for the darkness and to maximize its dignity by throwing all its details into relief so that you see it properly. This perfectly illustrates the Spirit's new covenant role. He is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on the Savior. Isn't that perfect? That just exactly captures the Spirit's role. The Spirit draws all the attention not to himself, but to Christ. You can tell if a revival is not of the Spirit by listening to what everyone is saying about it. If everyone is talking about the Spirit, oh, what a wonderful work of the Spirit. The Spirit is doing this. The Spirit is doing that. Isn't this awesome? Then you know that's not the Spirit <laughs> because the Spirit does not draw attention to himself. But if everyone is talking about how wonderful Christ is, what a great Savior we have. Isn't it wonderful what he did for us on the cross? If everyone's minds and heart is more and more enraptured with Christ and making much of Christ and boasting in him, then you know that the Spirit is at work. And so this is the Spirit's work of comforting us, knowing Christ by the Spirit working faith in our hearts, this is what comforts us. This is what gives us assurance. This is what gives us confidence. The Spirit comforts us and assures us and gives us a sense of confidence in the truth of God's Word by bearing witness to Christ, by showing us Christ, by drawing us to Christ, and enabling us to see and to trust in Christ. That's why the Spirit is called the Comforter. And then third, the Spirit remains with us forever. As taken from John 14, verses 16 to 20. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. This is Jesus talking to his disciples as he's about to go away from them. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Isn't that interesting that Jesus promises that he will come? to them. And again, he's not talking about the second coming at the end of history. He's talking about at Pentecost when the Spirit comes to the church. 
He's not talking about himself literally coming. He's talking about coming through the work of the Spirit. Now, of course, the Spirit is not Jesus. And so here we can get into that whole doctrine of the Trinity, right? We don't want to confuse the three persons of the Trinity. Jesus and the Spirit are not interchangeable. They're not identical with one another. The three persons of the Godhead are one in essence, and we believe there is one God, not three, and that each of the three persons of the Godhead are that one God. Nevertheless, we also believe that the three persons are distinct. They each have their unique personhood, and so I'm not saying that the Spirit is Jesus. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which the ministry of the Spirit is so focused on Jesus Remember this whole thing about he's going to bring, apply all that Christ is to us. That's his whole ministry is to apply the work of Christ to us. Because the ministry of the Spirit is so focused on Jesus that we can say that the Spirit's presence in our hearts is the presence of Jesus. It's the Spirit who brings Jesus to us, who makes Jesus real to us, and brings his presence to us. And we see this in verse 16. Um, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Isn't that interesting? Another helper, another comforter. Jesus himself is the first and the primary helper. He's our advocate. Remember, this word helper can mean a lot of different things. It can mean helper, comforter, and even advocate. And Jesus himself is our advocate. In fact, that title, advocate, Parakletos, which is applied to the Spirit here in the Gospel of John, is also applied to Jesus in John's first epistle in 1 John. Uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. That's the same word. So Jesus is the primary helper, the primary advocate. But he's saying, I'm going to send another helper, another advocate, who is going to be my representative and who will bring me to you. And I think it helps to kind of understand what Jesus is saying here by thinking about, well, what did that mean for the disciples in, their, in the time when they were with Jesus, when he was here on earth during his earthly ministry, going around and preaching the gospel and casting out demons and healing the sick and teaching and ministering to his disciples? In what way was Jesus like a comforter and a helper and an advocate to the disciples during that time? Well, just think about it. Think about how often Jesus was there for his disciples when they needed him. How often they had questions and doubts and he came to them and answered their questions and assured them when they had their doubts. Remember that one moment when they were straining at the oars during the storm on the Sea of Galilee? And they thought they were about to die, you know? They were just terrified. But what did Jesus do? He came to them as the helper, as the paraclete. He came to them and he calmed the storm, and he calmed their fears, and he said, it is I, I'm here, I'm with you, don't be afraid. Uh, again and again, Jesus was their rock, Jesus was their strength, Jesus was their guide. He had all the answers to their questions. He knew just what to say when the Pharisees challenged them. I'm thinking of that one incident in Matthew, in, in Matthew 15, where the Pharisees challenged the disciples, and they said, uh, how come you don't wash your hands before you eat? And of course, this had nothing to do with hygiene or trying to avoid germs. This had to do with the ceremonial law and trying to be in a state of ritual purity. And the Pharisees were challenging the disciples and making it seem like they were doing something wrong, that they were breaking God's law, that they were not right, that they weren't doing the right thing. And what did Jesus do? He defended them. He stood up for them. He said, let me explain to you why they don't do that. He, ex he defended the, Pharise the, the, the disciples against the Pharisees when they were falsely accused. He stood there on their, on their side to be their advocate and to comfort them. And so you can imagine that as the disciples are here in the upper room with Jesus and the night before he's about to go to the cross, and he's telling them, look, I'm going away, that they're getting a little bit anxious about that because their comforter, their defender, their advocate is about to leave. And so he's saying to them, do not be afraid because I will send another helper to you. The Spirit will take up where Jesus left off 
And even though Jesus has gone into heaven to be with the Father, to sit at the right hand of God, the Spirit will be present to continue this defending, comforting, advocate ministry of, this, of, of Jesus among them. The Spirit's presence will in fact be the presence of Jesus among them. We see the same thing again in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Here he uses a, a slightly different way of explaining it, but it's the same thought, right? I'm sure the disciples were afraid that as Jesus is about to go, that they're going to be abandoned. They're going to be left like orphans. And you can imagine this for yourself, right? If you have kids, you can imagine being a parent, telling your kids that you're going to leave them. I'm talking about like little kids, not if they're adults. But if they're like small kids, can you imagine telling them, I'm going to go away, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, and you're going to have to fend for yourselves. Can you imagine how terrifying that would be for kids? And also uh, hard for the parents to be able to say that, right? But Jesus is saying that even though you're afraid, even though you're worried that I'm leaving you, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. You're not going to be on this earth having to just figure it out for yourself as if you have to go it alone. I'm not abandoning you. I'm going to be with you. And that's what he said, right, when he ascend, before he ascended to heaven in Matthew 28. And he gave the Great Commission. He told the disciples to go to all the world. He said that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And he repeats this thought again in verse 20. He says, in that day, talking about this time, basically the church age, in that day when I'm gone, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He will be present by the Spirit. By the ministry of the Spirit, he will be present with his disciples to comfort them in their sorrow, to strengthen them in their pilgrimage, to equip them in their ministry, and to guide them. What a wonderful Savior we have. From one point of view, Jesus seems very absent, doesn't he? We struggle with that. We don't see him. Where is Jesus? He's, he's left this earth. He's ascended to the right hand of God, and we don't see him with our eyes. But yet, from another point of view, through the gift of the Spirit, Jesus is not absent from us. He has not left us. Jesus is present here among us in the Spirit whom he sent to us. We have another helper who is with us, who is in us. And so in this way, Jesus is keeping his promise. I will always be with you, even to the end of the age. Now, the Catechism has this interesting statement at the very end, that third work of the Spirit, that the Spirit will remain with us forever. I think that that uh, draws our attention to the forward-looking hope that will be fulfilled when Christ does return visibly at the last day and grants us the ultimate fulfillment of our salvation, which is what? The glorification of our bodies and the new heavens and the new earth. And so the Spirit dwelling with us now until that day is like the glory cloud that led Israel in the wilderness and finally brought them over the, ri the river Jordan into the promised land. And then, when they were in the promised land, then the glory cloud took up permanent residence in the tabernacle and later in the temple in Jerusalem. And that is what the Spirit is with us. The Spirit is like a pledge leading us to that ultimate goal. The Spirit is with us now as we're in the wilderness, we're in the time, time of temptation and testing and doubt and difficulty and sin and sorrow and all the difficulties of this life. But the Spirit is that glory cloud leading us through the temptations, leading us through the wilderness as the pledge that one day all of our trials will be over, all of our tribulations will be over. One day we will cross over the Jordan into the heavenly inheritance. The Spirit is a down payment of heaven guaranteeing that we will be brought safely to heaven. What a wonderful Savior we have. He has come into this world to reveal the Father to us. He has accomplished the redemption of sinners by his mighty death on the cross. He bore the wrath of God that we deserve because of our sins. He dealt with our sin. He has granted us forgiveness. He has reconciled us to God so that we can now call God our Father and know that we are adopted as his children. And then he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, 
but he didn't leave us. He didn't leave us down here to struggle alone. He didn't leave us as orphans. He sent his most precious gift, the gift of the comforter, to be with us and to be in us forever. And the comforter's ministry is really an extension of Christ himself. The comforter brings the very life of Christ himself to us. And so really, we lack nothing, even though we, we still have doubts and we have to walk by faith, and we still have struggles and difficulties. In reality, we lack nothing by having Jesus go away. In fact, we have Jesus with us in a new and higher way, so that in this person of the Spirit, we have Jesus himself living within us to strengthen us and to encourage us. Let us rejoice in the person and work of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Let us rejoice in all that he has done for us and continues to do in us. Let us pray.